Hi, I'm Courtney DeKalb Myers. I'm the Cleveland County Horticulture Educator, and today I'm here at the Norman Central Library with the Pioneer Library System. And today we're going to talk a little bit about xeriscaping. So, xeriscaping is the idea of sort of water conservation and using drought tolerant plants within your landscape so that you don't have to use quite so much water within your landscape and that those plants are a little bit more resilient. So when thinking about xeriscaping, your mind might travel to Arizona, New Mexico, very, very dry places, lots of cactus, lots of rock. Uh, and you might think, well, that, that, you know, that's pretty, but it's not really for me. Well, really here in Oklahoma, we get a little bit too much rainfall for those plants to be very successful. In fact, something like cactus and those things would really rot here with all of our rainfall that we get in the springtime. And so xeriscaping here really is more using native or resilient plants that are kind of native more to the prairie. Xeriscaping comes from the Greek word xeros, which means dry. And so xeriscaping is not zero scaping. It doesn't mean not having a landscape. It means having a more dry landscape. So when it comes to xeriscaping, we have seven different principles of xeriscaping to have a more dry, more water conservative garden. First is going to be planning and design. Second is going to be improving the soil. Third is to use appropriate plants and zones within your landscape. Fourth is to create practical turf areas. Five is using mulches. Six is irrigating efficiently. And then seven is maintaining the landscape properly. So we'll dive into these a little bit more in depthly, starting with principle number one, which is planning and design. So if you're looking to have a more water conservative, more dry type landscape, it's a good idea to go ahead and go out into your landscape and take inventory of what you've already got. And so consider some of the areas that you have that are really, really dry. Consider some of the areas that you may have shade or more moisture in your soil. Consider where your watering hose is or where your irrigation is. You may have an existing landscape around your home and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go and pull everything out to have a xeric garden, but just taking inventory of what you've already got. Also consider some of the microclimates within your landscape. And so a lot of times, places that are gonna warm up very quickly or stay very dry are gonna be near or around concrete uh, because those tend to hold a lot of heat. So the second principle of having a xeric garden is improving the soil. And when it comes to improving the soil, what you can do is you can get a soil test. So we do soil tests at our extension office and you can come uh, and drop off your soil with us. We will send it to the labs at OSU Stillwater. They will run their analysis on it and then we'll get the results back. We'll be able to write you a tailored fertilizer program to what's in your soil so that you can make the necessary amendments. But not just nutrients are important for improved soil. You also want to include organic matter. So organic matter is heavily decomposed material within your soil. And having organic matter within your soil really helps with water retention and holding on to that water and also can help with drainage. And so having more organic matter within your soil can really help make it a more resilient type soil. So moving on to the third principle of xeric gardening is using appropriate plants and zoning out your landscape. So as you take inventory, consider the different sections of your yard and start begin to design around those certain sections of your yard. Each of those sections might have unique or different requirements and consider that as you choose those plants. When selecting plants, native is really a good bet as far as what's gonna be adapted to our environment, but it's not necessarily just natives. Consider, for example, Russian sage, which is not native to the United States, uh, but it's a very well adapted, very beautiful, very xeric plant that we can include in our landscapes. The fourth principle is to create practical turf areas. And so while turf does take some nutrients and some inputs like water and fertilizer, turf isn't all bad. Turf has a very functional purpose. Perhaps if you wanna go play catch with your sun, or maybe you wanna go do your morning yoga, or you wanna play bocce ball, or have a picnic out on your lawn, you're still gonna need some turf areas. So consider your lifestyle, consider what you like to do, and design around that, creating practical turf areas so that you have a functional space to do the things that you want to do. 
sort of a design concept too with turf is that it really creates like a frame around your landscape uh, and kind of can serve as a nice soft spot for the eye to rest as it's looking at all of the plants within your garden. So the fifth principle of xeriscaping is using mulches. Mulches play a really important role in the garden, the landscape and the vegetable garden and various trees that you might be growing on your property. So mulches are really important because they lock in moisture within that soil. They also help extreme fluctuations within your soil and they can also suppress weed seeds, which is kind of a benefit if you don't wanna be out in your garden weeding all the time. I'd also encourage you to use organic mulches. And so by that, I don't necessarily mean certified organic. I just mean something that's gonna break down over time. And as those organic mulches break down over time, they add a little bit of that organic matter back to the soil, continually improving your soil. And so some examples of organic mulches include wood chips, pine straw, cotton seed holes, sawdust and compost as well. So those are all examples of some organic mulches that you can use within your landscape to break down and to add some organic matter back to your soil. The sixth principle of xeriscaping is to irrigate efficiently. And so you've built this landscape, you've zoned this landscape to be appropriate for xeric conditions and for not a whole lot of water. So make sure that you're, when you're irrigating, you're doing it in a way that is efficient. And so consider things like zoning your irrigation systems. And so if you have an area where you know that the plants might require a little bit more water, separate that zone from areas where there are more xeric plants. And so consider watering that for a longer period than the ones that don't need a whole lot of water. Try not to just turn on your irrigation system and let it run through its cycle without kind of considering what's going where. It's also a good idea to water in the morning. That prevents the water from sitting on plants overnight uh, and causing any maybe disease issues that way. And is also more efficient than watering in the heat of the day where a lot of that water is lost to evaporation. Cycle and soak irrigation is gonna be more efficient. And so by that, I mean watering more infrequently and very thorough. And so try to water very thoroughly uh, and then turn off that irrigation system or avoid irrigating for a long period of time before going back to water. And so really try to soak into the soil, let that soil dry out again before watering again. So this is different than watering for a short period of time very frequently. Because if we water for a short period of time and we do it very frequently, then those root zones are going to stay pretty small. So the roots aren't very encouraged to go very deep. And so try to irrigate in a way that saturates the soil and then letting it dry out. Also some downsides to irrigation just to consider. You may have issues with runoff. So try to avoid any issues with runoff because that might go off into the storm drain uh, and carry any pollutants into the storm drain. So don't water in a way that causes any runoff. Also consider that you may lose some water to evaporation. And as that water evaporates, it's not going into the soil and it's not serving your landscape. That might increase your water bill a little bit, so just be aware of that as well. And then we can also have some issues with leaching where we water too much and that water goes into the soil profile uh, along with important nutrients. And so try really to be very conscientious and very intentional with your irrigation. And at the end of the day, it's gonna save you money if you try not to water quite as often. And then the seventh principle of xeriscaping or xeric design is to maintain your landscape properly. And so the best design, the best intentions are wasted if it's not maintained after the design process. And so consider continually checking on your landscape and making sure that there's not improvements needed because once you put it all in, it's not gonna stay perfect or pristine. Plants are living things that continue to grow. Uh, and so try to come back in and maintain that landscape. So consider things like your mulch. As it breaks down, you might need new fresh mulch. Plants are gonna continue to grow uh, and they may need to be divided after a few years. And so the best design is wasted if you don't go in and try to maintain your landscape over time. So you may be thinking, well, hey, now, okay, I want these xeric plants. Where do I go to get these xeric plants or how do I know? Uh, check out the Oklahoma State University fact sheet website. We have a few fact sheets on how to design xeric gardens or gardens for water conservation. And we have long extensive plant lists 
of plants that we've tried and we've grown to make sure that they don't require a lot of water and will do really well in your garden. So check out that website for more information on the different plants that you can use for your Xeriscape. Thank you.